do 19º episódio de Block Talks, a gente conversa em inglês com Shannon Ewing. Ela conta pra gente não só da sua jornada com blockchain, mas também como o blockchain pode revolucionar os processos de ajuda humanitária. Eu sou Maurício Magaldi e esse é o Block Drops, o primeiro podcast em português sobre blockchain para negócios. These news are not a form of endorsement, sponsorship or encouragement for consumption and are meant for educational purposes only. All right, everybody. So I'm here today with Shannon Ewing and she's going to tell us who she is and what she does with blockchain. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, for lack of a better term, call myself a blockchain humanitarian. My background's in international development and humanitarian aid, and I worked in places like Haiti after the earthquake, and I've been working with different kinds of technologies around the world, trying to bring in telework markets to places that don't have great job resources, different kinds of e-learning to places that are still uh, adopting computers. I'm dating myself now because that dates back about 15 years. But I am really excited about what blockchain and decentralized technologies are going to do for our neighbors and emerging markets. There's so much about this technology that's going to add freedom and more choice, more options for mobility, more um, you know, financial inclusion, you know, things like self-sovereign identity for people who are displaced, like the the Options are endless, but really it's going to impact everyone in the world. Um, but I'm the, the most excited about helping bring these resources to places that are already kind of lacking them. You know, this is a very first for us here with the podcast as we brought, you know, people from traditional industries such as financial services, public sector, technology. I think it's the first time we have someone who works in this humanitarian space. Can you sort of give us a little bit of background as to you know what that is exactly and what it takes for someone to work in that space? Uh, well, the, the short of it is a little bit of masochism. Unfortunately, a lot of the humanitarians that you'll meet are a little bit crazy. Uh, we do things in terrible conditions. You know, we're off, often working in natural disasters or war zones with no running water, no electricity, lots of disease, you know, often some danger. So uh, a little bit of being nuts is helpful, but mostly it has to do with really being dedicated to everyone having access to resources. You know, at the end of the day, um, I'm an American and I'm super lucky that I just happened to be born in the right place. You know, there's, there's very little difference between me and someone who was born into a country that's been fraught with civil war. So if I have as much, uh, you know, blessings and, and access to things in my life, um, then it, for me, it's a life mission to go and help spread that. So a lot of the humanitarian work that you'll see has to do with working with people who have just experienced a tsunami or need medical access in the middle of, like we said, you know, some sort of war zone. Uh, international development is a little bit different. That has to do with um, helping to develop an economy and bring in resources where they historically haven't existed. So an example of that would be I worked in Kosovo as they were getting ready to declare their own nationhood. And at the time, they had a 47% unemployment rate. So they had a higher percentage of college graduates than most countries on the planet. They had tons of programmers, really brilliant developers with nowhere to work. So for that project, we worked um, to bring in things like o Odesk before telework was really a thing. Before people knew that they could work online and earn international wages, we went in and tried to um, spread the word that there's ways that you can stay at home in Pristina and earn international er living. You know, you can work for someone in Italy and make a living wage and not have to move because at the time everyone was leaving the country. So those are very two different approaches on how to bring resources in where they don't currently exist and um, not a totally uh, direct line to how that ties into blockchain technology itself. And I understand this is pretty far out of left field for your audience. But what's really exciting about some of the technology that our brilliant developers in the decentralized space are coming up with are ways that we can add freedom in, in methods that it's never existed before. So going back to self-sovereign identity, if you take, uh, for example, the Rohingya population in Bangladesh, 
they fled uh, Myanmar, so they will never go back home. You know, they were persecuted there. It was dangerous. It's probably still dangerous, which means they don't have any nationhood in their country of origin. They are now living in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is not going to acknowledge them as Bangladeshi citizens. So where do you go? Where do you get a passport? How do you have uh, the means to relocate when you actually don't exist, according to many governments? With blockchain technology, we can, do, we can provide self-sovereign identity that isn't issued by a government that is still validated, that allows them to prove they had a job in this hospital, they have this track record of contributing, you know, here, here is my personhood. So there's a bunch of different technologies, and I, I get really excited about this stuff, so I don't want to be too long-winded. But, you know, again, for displaced people, things like cash transfers. We're seeing a large, uh, you know, crypto adoption down in places like Venezuela as people lose access to their own currencies, as they get hyperinflation, as they leave home. Sending people Bitcoin has been a great way to get them resources when they didn't have them. And we're seeing the adoption of cryptocurrencies in crazy places like parking garages, where it was taking up to an hour with the intermittent electricity, with the inability to process credit cards. It was taking people a really long time just to exit the parking garage of, say, a shopping mall. So small kiosks started accepting cryptocurrencies where they could just transfer it from cell phone to cell phone. And that started spreading into the shopping mall among retailers. And now we're seeing retail adoption. So again, I don't want to go on too long, but these kinds of things really excite me because it means we're bringing help and new systems to people that were really stuck with broken ones. With your background, how did you go from on the humanitarian side, reaching that to, you mentioned a few technologies, and then how did blockchain enter your space? Mm. Uh, it was a very random conference, actually, run by uh, a group called D10E and my friend Matt McKibben. They, they had a conference for startup societies in San Francisco in 2017. And the whole first day was a bunch of, quote unquote, my people. You know, they were talking about um, a startup society is where you test out an innovative political system or an alternative economic model on a small group of willing volunteers. So, you know, different ways that we can try out systems before we expand them and roll them out in an experimental way on a broader population. And the first day was full of speakers that I knew, you know, we'd worked on projects internationally together. And the whole second day was blockchain and Bitcoin. And I was really confused about how we would go from one topic to the, the other and what they were doing with each other. And there was a lot of technical talk and I was getting ready to walk out of the room and just let the, the techies speak to one another when someone told me that the next speaker coming to the stage had helped cure a, a village of Ebola using blockchain technology. I had no idea what that meant, <laughs> but they had my attention. And that speaker was a woman named Tony Lane Casserly, who is no longer with us, but she was a visionary in terms of being really vocal really early about the potential of the technology and being really committed to helping. And because she had been so vocal, uh, someone reached out to her when the Ebola outbreak in Liberia had gotten to the point where the banks were shut down. There was really uh, a massive backlog of supplies at the local airport because no one was working customs, no one was working in the financial institutions, and they couldn't get medical supplies into the country to help cure people. And she transferred them Bitcoin and freed, freed up a bunch of medical supplies. So it was as simple as that. But it was this strange hook of, you know, what are you talking about that we can actually help these kinds of problems with some sort of new technology? And from there, I just jumped down the rabbit hole of learning about token economics and thinking about different ways that we can actually have more people offering value into a system and have that value expand rather than having it based entirely on monetary contribution and investment. And it was just this this long exploration of, of what happens when we really start to ask ourselves, what is money and what is value and how do we trade it with one another? And and so then it was just, um, you know, learning as much as I possibly could, listening to great podcasts like this, you know, going down the YouTube rabbit hole. And I've I spent three years on the road attending as many conferences and speaking about different ways that this is going to help 
um, more people than we initially expected. You know, the term in our industry is social impact, which unfortunately is really weak because it doesn't mean much to many people. Um, it's just way too vague. So for me, I really like to speak about what these resources are going to do for emerging economies. And, and I just, uh, you know, I've been shouting from the rooftops as much as I can, because I think right now we have, we have such great potential and what we really need to do is kick the tires on it. We just need to test and test and test and fail and test again. And we need to do it on people such as, such as you and, and me who have backup systems for identity, for banking, for money transfers, so that when we roll it out to our friends who don't have these same resources, we know that it's going to work and it's not going to fail and leave them more vulnerable. Not surprising, but most interesting is that you were about to leave the room because it's so techy. And, and that's some sort of uh, the care that we take here with the podcast and the conferences that we participate is to not to be so removed from someone's reality that they don't want to talk about it or, or listen about it and, and end up not participating. And thank God you got hooked by that use case. And then you, you know, stayed in the room and now we're here talking about this. This is serendipity in another level. <laughs> Well, and I think, you know, we're human. We don't like to admit when we don't understand something. It makes us feel dumb and nobody appreciates that. And there's no reason why when we're speaking to more general audiences that we need to to dive into how the tech works. You know, people ask, they probably ask you all the time. I get asked all the time, how does blockchain technology function? And Frankly, unless you're, you know, an encryptionist or, you know, you're a developer, like none of that matters. You don't understand necessarily the you know, alternating current in your walls that is turning your lights on. You just know that when you flip the switch, things that you want to have happen, happen. People don't need to understand how blockchain technology functions. They need to know that they can send money to their family overseas for six cents versus 60 bucks. You know, like they, they just need to know what's the use case and why it matters. And so it's our job to speak in a lot of anal analogies and make it as digestible as possible. And it's one of the reasons I love your podcast is it's, it's so easy for people to understand and you're speaking directly to them and not over their heads. Thanks for that. Yeah. Well, well that's uh, sort of part of the mission, right? But uh, one thing that I really wanted to talk to you about, and now that I know a little bit more about your journey with this and the industry space you're operating what are and you've you've kind of glanced over uh but what are say the top three cases on the humanitarian space where you see blockchain bringing most value you mentioned sort of monetary freedom which is i think one that we can elaborate more you mentioned identity and you mentioned the Ebola case, which is sort of monetary, but maybe not. Are these the top three? Are there any others that you think are, okay, so this is this can only happen in this particular fragile humanitarian situation because of a blockchain solution has been thought specifically for this. Are there any cases that you can think of and, and share with us that we can say, well, this can only happen because this is running on a blockchain? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I think one of the things that we're going to see is some interesting leapfrogging where we're actually going to learn from emerging economies in quote unquote developed economies. Um, just as we had to, you know, lay a bunch of telephone wire in the Western world and then places like, you know, the continent of Africa just jumped ahead and all had cell phones without going through all of that. I think, especially with identity, we're going to have a lot of people adopting these new technologies for more because they need them more than we do. And the benefits from that are going to start spreading. And then we're going to adopt them in ways that we hadn't in Western economies or, you know, places that already have robust identity systems. So again, you know, going back to the Rohingya example, having an identity that is international that can follow you anywhere and can prove that you have a track record of different things has a bunch of different implications you know that can that can spread out to your educational system there's a really great program called teacher that says you know why do you pay all of this money just to have the the name of the university that you graduated from when no one actually sees what you studied 
if we have what you studied on a blockchain, it doesn't matter if you got it from a university, we can now see the breadth of your interests and everything that you've completed. I think those kinds of things might start in developing economies and then spread kind of outwards from there. So I don't know if there's anything that's actually going to be only for humanitarian aid, um, save things like the UNICEF program. They have put um, identities onto blockchain technology in places like Syria, where they're using uh, retinal scans to ensure that people aren't getting like, quote unquote, double dipping in their uh, humanitarian aid distributions. So they'll go into what's essentially like a UNICEF grocery store. They'll go pick out the rice, the beans, you know, whatever it is that they're wanting to bring home to their families. And then their blockchain identity, you know, um, gets gets dinged essentially on the way out so that they know this person has hit their $40 a week limit or whatever it is. So that's one case that would be solely humanitarian. Um, but, you know, again, we can quickly think of different ways that that would end up um, spreading out into the Western world as well. You know, I think we're already working on different ways where your cell phone is going to be your only identity soon. It's going to have your driver's license on it. It's going to have all of your health records. And I personally hope that we use things like blockchain for that because, uh, you know, as we've seen in, in Equifax and a, a billion other instances, there's just way too much data insecurity right now. So that's a long circumvented uh, answer to your question. I don't, I don't know that there's only a case that would affect humanitarian needs, but I do see quite a few in which it starts in humanitarian environments and then spreads back out. A particular subject that is of very concern in most industries, and it, it shouldn't be different in the humanitarian space, with, which is data privacy, data ownership. When you mention about doing a retinal scan and checking that, hash against the hash on a blockchain confirming that the person still have balances for the week you can't change the retina a biometry of someone and when when that is the case you you can't change that in the blockchain either because that's one of the characteristics of blockchain is immutability so being those populations in fragile situation and having their biometrical metadata being stored in a blockchain, isn't this of concern for them to be exposed? Even if it's the access is controlled and there's, you know, of course, some strong authentication and identity management around this, the fact that we're using biometrical metadata in particular situations, especially for fragile populations, isn't this of concern for those who are involved or even for the populations themselves? 100%. That is, you hit the nail on the head. There is a there's a big moral dilemma in that for me around the fact that, you know, as you said, these are not passwords. This is not something that you can change later and like revoke access to. You know, this organization now has your retina on file. And we're dealing with populations that in certain individuals, they're not digitally literate. So if we're dealing with somebody who doesn't entirely understand what you're doing and you're you're holding out the carrot of humanitarian aid and then saying you need to provide me with your biometrics as a means to getting that and they don't totally understand the implications of that or maybe they do understand the implications but they feel like they have to provide it to you in order to feed their family you've now set up a very morally complicated situation and I had a, a, I had an opportunity to go help the Rohingya a couple of years ago, and it's a, it's a, an issue that's really close to my heart. And I, wa I was so excited to be able to go and help try to bring resources to the population. And in looking at it deeper, I recognized that you know until we are really really confident on the privacy and the strength of the platform and its unhackability, you know, like we need to make sure that this thing is so secure. It is airtight because if if you end up with a breach, you have now provided really personal information, possibly to the people who or persecuted them in the first place, like the reason that they ran. You could now open this all up to those same, you know, those same groups. And it broke my heart, but I had to say no, because at the end of the day, people are not lab rats. 
You know, these are not laboratories in which we can test things out and make mistakes, especially when they're already vulnerable. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, data privacy is a really big problem right now. And we're still, you know, I think we're infants when it comes to digital privacy. We're just tottering around making a bunch of mistakes. And that opens up a whole big swarm of problems. That's one of the things that when we initially started off with the podcast, one of the use cases that came up was your health record on a blockchain to facilitate data sharing. You still own your data, but you can share that with your doctor, with the hospital where you need to go. Or in, And one of the things that we discussed was, okay, so now if uh, I have pre-existing conditions and then the regulations change, and, and that was sort of on the verge of the uh, Affordable Care Act and all that stuff. And one of the big discussions were, okay, so now, your insurance company has on a blockchain an immutable record that you had pre-existing conditions. There is no way in the world you're going to run away from having, you know, access premium because now that's written on a blockchain and you gave access to them because you needed the plan, right? Of course, it's a more civilized situation because we're talking about Western regular civilization population that are not exposed to other threats other than this particular ones off of the government. But that also speaks to the same situation, albeit a little bit uh, more radical when, you, when you're talking about this vulnerable populations that are fleeing from home and they have nowhere to go and they don't even uh, have, a, as you mentioned, a, a backup uh, identity systems that you know can tell who they are for whoever else is asking. So I think it's in the very same problem space, albeit with different and more sort of aggressive implications when you're talking about Western civilization and people who are fleeing from civil wars and stuff like that. So uh, you know, when we're talking about blockchain, because the immutable nature of the system and the data sitting on it, the design has to be not only how we solve the original problem, is how we don't create other problems that might be unsolvable later because now things are immutable. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a big problem for all of us. You know, the the Equifax hack a couple of years ago exposed people's, you know, like deepest identity markers in terms of a Western civilization. You know, in the U.S., we have social security numbers. And once you have access to that, it was really easy for people to take out credit cards in other people's names. And, you know, there was all of these implications that came from it. And that, frankly, came from mismanagement, you know, uh, in, in Argentina, the Equifax login for their database was literally password and admin. Like they had just never updated their their security systems. So if we're not paying attention to this stuff really carefully, you know, the, the implications are pretty bad. I mean, I don't know if you watched the ledger hack that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. But I think it was like 700,000 people's data got released. And these are people who already work in decentralized technologies who should absolutely be paying attention and, and know better. And, and you know, it's not that they, they chose this. Obviously, they were doing everything that they could to keep the data private. But we don't know where the back door is until somebody finds it. And you hope that you find it first. But, you know, the implications are huge. And there's the... I, I, I don't want to say threat, but the evolution of computer systems towards quantum computing could end up putting more pressure on cryptography. And when we talk about decentralized systems, cryptography is the real technological backbone to them. And we're talking about quantum computing that can do, you know, stuff, I don't mean a billion times fold, right? In comparison to what we can do today, these are yet another layer of concern when we're talking about data breaches and privacy and decentralized systems, because now we don't know how big of a threat this could end up being if we have the legacy, you know, in quotes, now legacy blockchain uh, in face of quantum hacking, right? Exactly. And now we've opened up a whole hornet's nest that we didn't even foresee. I don't know if it's open to to naming names, but there's a couple of people who are doing really great work in the data privacy space, including um, my friends Brittany Kaiser and Joe Toscano, that are working in different ways about you know how can we first educate people just so they're even thinking about these things. You know, my first role when I entered the the blockchain space was with a company called Presearch, 
which is a decentralized search engine. So they're, they're they operate on an ERC twenty token and and work like a private Google that rewards you for creating you know the searches that you do on the platform. And uh, one of the things that, that I found when I was just you know moving around the space was you know talking to people about how much their privacy is being used against them, you know, how much their data is being used against them in this space and their privacy is being invaded. Um, even people in the in the blockchain space would tell me, I love using 100% Google products because they're so convenient and I don't care that they're selling my information. Or I'll accept that they're selling my information because I'm lazy, basically, you know, and and I think it's it's up to it's up to us as a community to educate each other on what happens when we put all of our information out there and we can't pull it back. And that's one of the things, again, we're kind of in our infancy when it comes to digital literacy about, you know, the internet is forever. You think that you can erase things, but we're finding out in really challenging ways that that's not the case. And, you know, podcasts and speaking to people, you know, I think you're doing a huge service right right now in just letting people um, start to explore, like, what does it mean when I'm putting my data out there? Because you are completely right. Once we start putting these things on blockchains, um, we don't know what happens 30 years down the road. In the position that we're in, even if we don't know the answers to these, but to ask the hard questions in due time, I think is of responsibility that we do so, right? Because uh, then if, if we don't, then who else will? And we have a platform, we speak to qualified audiences that might not be thinking about this, but they are in positions of uh, defining things and making decisions that impact other people, uh, and especially in vulnerable places. I think it's of our own responsibility to do so. And I'm glad we're having this conversation because this is one of the things that I think we don't think about or don't discuss about so much. So yeah, thanks, thanks for, for bringing that up. Now, I want to just uh, shift a little bit and um, pick your brain on, in your industry, what are the potential use cases that we haven't seen yet that you think would be, that would benefit from having it lay on a blockchain or have a blockchain as part of the backbone? Because I don't understand your industry so much. Of course, I have an idea, but I, I'm not familiar and I, you know, maybe my, my audience isn't either. What would be the, the cases that you see? Okay, so this is a prominent thing. This is a problem in my space that hasn't been tackled yet. And I think that blockchain would make this viable because of this particular you know, situation or characteristic. Well, hands down, the largest topic is pretty obvious. Um, it's remittances. So I think, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the most recent numbers, but remittances are something like a trillion dollar economy each year of movement of, of funds uh, around the country or around the world. I'm so sorry. The way that that currently happens is, I mean, there, there's a, a trillion ways in which it happens, but it's it's clunky. You know, if you use traditional systems or formal systems, you're looking at 30% fees through platforms like Western Union. And even then, you have to have your family members live near a Western Union office for that to work. You know, you'll hear many stories about somebody who goes to the Western Union office and they have a cousin of a cousin who lives in that city who then drives four hours to get into the village where your mother lives. And actually, you know, so it's like a five day process of transferring and receiving and going from one hand to another to another to finally reach your mom. And since, you know, it, with all of those hands in the middle, you lose sometimes over 50% of the funds between one spot and another. You know, the way that we can just do peer-to-peer -peer cash transfers is going to be a massive game changer. And there are projects that are working on it. One of the biggest issues so far is adoption. You know, how do we let people know that this works? How do we make it really easy? How, you know, the whole crypto community is working on ways that you don't have to exit back out of crypto and into fiat. So whoever figures out the remittance market is going to change the world. Identity is really interesting. I think voting is going to be really great on a, with blockchain technologies. Something that I'm interested in for my own benefit in, in the West, you know, and in America in particular is something called uh, liquid democracy, where we can actually vote on all of the initiatives rather than having representational uh, democracy. 
for example, where I'm from, um, I'm from a state called Colorado, and there are essentially four people representing our entire state. And there's no way that those people are going to think the same way that I do about the environment, about the economy, about health care. And so it would mean that I could I could vote on each of those or I could say, you know, there's an initiative that's coming out that has to do with um business privacy or something. And my friend Maurizio knows much more about that than I do. I'm going to, I'm going to cede my vote to him and he's going to vote for me uh, on this initiative. And then maybe you had a professor who knows more than you do. And, and pretty soon we now have experts voting on, or, or, you know, again, even ourselves voting on issues, initiatives rather than just having one politician who's supposed to know about all of these different industries. I think that's going to be huge um, for for inclusion in many countries. You know, in in a lot of places in the developing world, it's really easy to sway an election based on small cash handouts because people just aren't aren't paying attention in different ways, and that they haven't ever felt included. And the way that voting is going to change inclusion for all of us, I think, is exciting. Um, and the way that it's going to help with corruption. One of the biggest things in my industry has to do with philanthropy. And if you donate money to uh, to a nonprofit today, the largest concern when people donate is that the, mo- the money is going to go to what they donated it for, you know, that it's actually going to reach the ground. It's not going to be mismanaged. It's not going to be spent somewhere that you didn't agree to. And when you have um, philanthropy through smart contracts, you can do something for example, build an orphanage. And rather than giving a group $100,000 and just hoping that they spend that money wisely, you can release the first $10,000 to go get the permits. And once the permits have been validated, you can unlock the second $10,000 to go buy the bricks. And on and on until each of the smart contracts has been triggered by you know responsible use of the funds along the way. And now you've got much more transparency for the donors. You have more accountability on the ground. You have much less room for corruption and people stealing along the way or even being, you know, coerced into offering bribes and those kinds of things. Um, I have no idea what numbers are being donated to nonprofits around the world today, but that's going to be another, you know, potentially trillion dollar change in the way that we operate. These are certainly critical use cases. Most of them we haven't explored in the podcast. So we'll keep an eye out for these cases and I'll pick your brain offline for sure for, uh, you know, future topics to speak to, uh, to the audience here. But yeah, thanks so much. These are very interesting and the, the initial impact is always the ones, the, the, the impacts that we see. But for all of them, there are so many more derivative impacts that, that are expected or that, will, that we are not seeing firsthand. When you talk about elections and transparency and uh, managing public funds on a more transparent way, we know that there's this huge waste of public money that goes because there's all this kinks in the process and there's like shadowy things that we don't have the visibility even if it's like a formal legal process it's so inefficient that the money just you know leaks out that when we have more transparency in these types of public processes what we will likely see is an axis of public funds that are now visible and they can be used for you know better things and you don't even have to mess with, you know, tax brackets or anything because there is excess public money. It just gets, you know, better used and better managed that you don't have to just pile up on, you know, tax on people to achieve what you were doing before. You were achieving much more. So I don't have the expectation that these things are going to happen overnight because that means that we're messing with incumbents who might be benefiting from the current situation. So the status quo is always a big problem for these massive transparency changes. But the benefits are so overwhelming that I think that at some point we'll have critical mass enough that will tell us, okay, this is the way to go because we're just not enough fulfilling our you know mission if we don't do so. So yeah, here's, here's hoping to that. 
man, re recording this from the United States in the beginning of 2021 and the mess that we just watched happen in our elections that, quite frankly, we we will probably never know. As a population, we will never know if the election was tampered with or if it was straightforward or what happened. And listening to you say that now, like I, that world can't come soon enough as far as I'm concerned, you know, that it's, it's going to make such a massive difference for all of us. So cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, um, I, I think we should, we should wrap it up this, uh, this episode and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to have, to host you for, you know, a, a new one when we see some, some of these cases develop. Is there any particular parting words for our audience you want to you wanna leave us? Uh, I would just encourage people to keep trying and failing and trying and failing again. This technology is going to make such a difference for people around the world. And we just need to keep experimenting so that we learn more and we grow it. And, you know, we've had we've had Bitcoin for a dozen years now and we just keep waiting for the massive adoption and we we get that through trying and failing and then failing better so support your local startups you know test things out use you know products that are in beta contribute to github and and different platforms that are that are doing their best, you know, different, you know, go to hackathons. And, and even if you're not a developer yourself, there's tons of ways that we can contribute to these teams that are creating the products of the future. And we only get there by putting wind at their backs. Walk Drops podcast is available on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts and most of the major podcast platforms. You can contact us by email on blockdropspodcast at gmail.com, on Instagram at blockdropspodcast, and on Twitter at blockdropspod. Nosso salve vai obrigatoriamente para a Shannon Ewing, que tomou aí um tempinho para contar para a gente sobre todas essas novidades e potenciais do blockchain no espaço de ajuda humanitária. A gente fica por aqui. Até a próxima. Tchau. Música